Um, okay, so this webinar is going to be recorded. A couple housekeeping items before we get going. The chat will be open. So if you have questions during the presentation, feel free to pop them into the chat at any time. We are gonna do some live Q&A as well at the end of the speaking sessions. So if you wanna go ahead and unmute yourselves at those times to ask questions um, and engage in the dialogue and conversation, we'd really appreciate that. Um, it is optional to turn your video on, but it usually ends up being a more lively discussion if you can. So if it is appropriate for you, please feel free to turn on your camera. Um, and then, like I said, any questions, feel free to drop them into the chat or open them up once we start the Q&A. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Libby Sonia. She's gonna go ahead and get us going. Thanks so much, Kat. Can we start our slideshow, please? So good afternoon, I'm Libby Sonye. I'm the Executive Director of the Louisiana Policy Institute for Children. And we really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule today to join us for this webinar that we're co-hosting with ACCE um, on investing in Louisiana's youngest learners. Um, it's so good to see so many uh, friendly faces and friendly names who have been wild, wild supporters, uh, supporters of early care and education in our state. Next slide. Um, our speakers today are myself, um, Candace Weber, who is the Partnerships Director at the Louisiana Policy Institute for Children, and two of the finest champions I know for early care and education in our state, who are also Chamber um, Executives, Todd Murphy with the Jefferson Chamber of Commerce, and Tim Magner with the Greater Shreveport Chamber of Commerce. Next slide. And on our agenda today is really to talk about the economic case for early care and education in our state, the best practices from industry champions like Tim and Todd, um, a question and answer session, as well as a call to action, because uh, we can't leave today without a call to action, because we need your help as we really um, try to make sure that we have enough, we have the support we need for young children in our state. Next slide. And so I'll talk to you today about the economic case for early care and education in Louisiana that we have worked with um, with many people across the state to really understand what it's costing our state when families don't have access to early care and education, but also what it costs our state when families don't um, families and the state don't have access. Next slide. And the next slide. And so just a little bit about the Policy Institute for Children. Uh, we are a 501c3 nonpartisan non, uh, nonprofit organization that really believe that advancing policies to ensure Louisiana's youngest children are ready for success in school and in life. And we really envision a Louisiana in which all young children, birth age through four, are safe, healthy, and can reach their full potential. And our work at the Policy Institute really seeks to be a source of nonpartisan independent information on issues concerning young children in our state. And we do this by developing policy proposals informed by data research best practices and the experience of other states and for improving the outcomes of Louisiana's youngest children. And then we provide educational and outreach activities like the one today around the recommended policy solutions. Next slide. And so when we really think about early care and education, we think about those first five years of life um, and it really being a business issue for our state. Next slide. Um, and so at the end of the day, it's a Louisiana workforce productivity issue when families don't have access to quality early care and education. Because what we know is that 67% of our children birth through age four have both or their single parent in the workforce. And what we also know is that 61% of infants mothers go back to work within that critical first year of life. And that childcare in Louisiana costs almost as much as public college annual tuition, which statewide is around $8,700 a year for infants in the childcare center. Next slide. And so what we really wanted to do was to quantify what the gaps in reliable or affordable quality care and education of how they affect efficiency and the output of Louisiana's current workforce. And Louisiana was one of the first of its kind to really quantify this number. And we did that in our losing ground report. And then we've since updated this. Again, to really understand Louisiana's current workforce. Next slide. And so what we found out is that, you know, Yes, it's a workforce participation issue, but childcare issues greatly impact parents' workforce participation. And when you think about it, them turning down promotions, um, not going from part-time to full-time, 
um, going from full-time to part-time and then potentially being fired because of access to quality early care and education and having to quit their job. And so what we know is that childcare issues are everybody's issues at the end of the day. Next slide. And so you'll see here is that almost half the parents, both men and women, missed work regularly due to childcare issues uh, in the last three months when we did our original survey. And so you'll see people missed work, they were tardy or they left early. Uh, and so that's a significant amount of time for employers to, to not have their employees. And it's, it's hard for employees to not be able to be there to complete their job and the tasks that they wanna do. Next slide. And so if we really think about this, Next slide. Thank you. Um, so again, if thinking about childcare issues costing employers and the state, what we found in our most recent update to our losing ground report is that childcare instability leads to costly parental absences for businesses and causes large economic losses statewide. And so in our update of the losing ground report, what we found is that it costs uh, 762 million annually for the employers that they're losing because of loss of um, childcare, not having childcare. And it's costing the state 1.3 billion annually with loss of the economy. That's not 1.3 million, that's billion with a B. We're talking big dollars here. Um, you know, the loss of full-time childcare is associated with employment disruptions, including a higher rate of un unemployment among mothers and parents. What we know is they need access to quality childcare so they can go to work and school. Next slide. And so what we also know is that there's an issue for low wages related to childcare teachers that contribute to the high turnover in our state too. And so we're thinking about the turnover in our workforce of parents needing access to early care and education, but we're also having a high turnover rate with our childcare teachers in the state. And so what we know is that wages for childcare workers on average are about $9.76 per hour, which is lower than the national average and the Southern state average, which this is no big surprise to us in Louisiana because we even know our K-12 teachers are paid below the national average as well as the Southern state's average. And that Louisiana childcare businesses really struggle to find and retain talent. This isn't babysitting, this is education from the youngest age. And so we really need to have a skilled workforce. And additionally, childcare workers tend to turn over quickly and leave the profession early, which really negatively impacts quality of care um, to, to children. And so if we want to maintain high quality early care and education uh, programs, we have to make sure that we're maintaining our workforce within that industry as well. Next slide. And so our losing ground report and our update uh, was so successful, and I know Tim and Todd can both remember this, is that um, the U.S. Chamber Foundation released their report in Louisiana about workforce today and workforce of tomorrow um, because they really understood that this is the heart of the matter. We have to lay this crucial framework for tomorrow's workforce and by promote today, promoting today's workforce of high quality childcare because it really provides a powerful two generation approach to building the human capital of a prosperous and sustainable America that we know it requires. Next slide. And so, you know, just like the foundation of a house, um, we have to make sure that we are building children's brains. Um, and so what we know is that, you know, neuroscientists know, tell us that 80% of brain development happens between birth and age three, and that brains are built over time. And so as we think about building a foundation of a house, we want to make sure it's strong and st sturdy, because we know it's more costly to rebuild and repair later in later a uh, house that you've already built. So it's the same thing for little people's brains. We want to make sure that they're you know, being built from the ground up. Next slide. And that what we know is that early experiences affect the quality of the brain architecture. They can establish either a sturdy or a fra fragile foundation for all learning, health, and behavior. And that, the, again, the brain is like a foundation of the house. If it's not built right for the first time, it's really more expensive and difficult to fix later. Next slide. Uh, and so I've had the great fortune of working one, on one of the, the longest uh, longitudinal studies in the country related to quality early care and education and children having exposure in their first five years of life. 
And what we know from this, these longitudinal studies from the adversarian study in Prairie Preschool is that what we see are higher rates of intelligence, better reading and math scores, academic locus of control. So these kids believe that they have power over what they learn is greater. They also have better social competency, higher number of years in school, college attendance, as well as earning a four-year college degree, and then full-time employment. The other exciting thing is you think about the health benefits. Um, and so we see, you know, higher rates of cardiometabolic health. Next slide. And what we see for these, these little people that are now in their mid-40s um, is from this longitudinal work is that they've had, you know, lower rates of grade repetition, not needing special education pre, um, placement, not um, becoming teen parents, uh, less use of smoke and drug use, as well as less rate, lesser rates of teen depression and a reliance on governmental assistance and are less likely to be overweight with a high BMI and that they have lower risk factors that lead um, to outcomes as they age. Next slide. And so here's it all, it's all one compact slide, but this is just, those benefits are to the children. What we also found out are the benefits to the mothers of these children in education and employment. And so what we know is that when mamas do well, little people do well. And what we also know is that for the parents that receive, had children that received this high quality early care and education, that they're actually living longer as well. And so again, this is a two generation approach. It's not either or, it's both because we really wanna make sure that families have access to be able to go back to school and work. Next slide. And you know, at the end of the day, if you think about the, the takeaway, it's this, is when you spend more, you get more bang for your buck. And what Jim Heckman, the Nobel laureate uh, economist has done and used longitudinal research for is to say for every dollar that we spend in early care and education, quality early care and education, we get a 13% return on investment. I don't know about you all, but I know about me. I can't put my money anywhere and get that type of return on investment. Next slide. And so it's just really exciting to think about if we're gonna spend time, money, and resources that we do it in our youngest citizens. What we know too is that these studies of high quality early childhood program, programs have been shown to return. I mean, it's the 13% return on investment, but also of seven, if you think a return of $7 for $1 invested, notice that the res, these results are for high quality designs. And so I would be the first one to tell you that quality does matter and that poor quality is harmful. So if we're gonna put money after a system, let's put it on an accountability system like we have in Louisiana to make sure that our public dollars are going after good. Next slide. And so I would be remiss if I didn't talk to you a little bit about the impact of COVID-19 on our providers. And what we know is that childcare really now is, we've always known this, but it's been glaringly obvious, is that childcare is fundamental to supporting employers, uh, employees to be able to get to work. And that given the importance of early care and education sector to the overall economy, um, and we know that this sector is in a precarious, precariously financial state typically, that we really wanted to understand COVID-19's impacts on the child care providers. So the Louisiana uh, Policy Institute for Children, we are now conducting our fifth survey of child care providers from late um, September until mid-October related to the impacts of COVID-19. Next slide. And so here's what we saw. The financial outlook for providers remains bleak. Uh, but temporary closures resulting from potential or confirmed COVID-19 cases really exasperate the financial challenges for childcare. They, they operate on razor thin financial um, margins now and that providers continue to experience operational challenges throughout the pandemic, further really impacting their financial stability and complicating their ability to serve families. And that enrollment rates have fluctuated, fluctuated fluctuated, I'm sorry, and that the main driver of um, provider revenue is, is having enough children enrolled and that many of our providers remain below pre-pandemic levels. Some have waiting lists um, really trying to get children in, but they're also balancing the spread of the virus. And that combined with these factors uh, really leave Louisiana providers uh, uncertain of their ability to remain open in the long term. Next slide. And so the overall impact just that we were able to measure from March of 2020 
to uh, January 2021. And we think this is actually an underestimation underestim of what it costs um, the per our sector is $245 million of loss related to COVID-19. Again, we think that this is an underestimate, um, but it's, it's hard to really measure it, especially as you had relief dollars come in and relief dollars go out. But at the end of the day, this is a quantifiable, we're trying to quantify the number of what our child care providers lost throughout the state. Next slide. Um, and what we know is also in our work at the Policy Institute is that early investments pay off. Uh, we know that investing in ECE helps prevent future crime. Again, this 90% of brain development occurring before age four, and so that these early years are critical and building the, building the foundational skills for pro-social behaviors. Again, when we think about high quality early care and education, we really think about developing the whole child. Uh, and that what we know is that when we invest in the whole child through early care and education is that we're less likely to, to see these children as they age arrested or engaged in violent crime. And that investment in high quality early care and education can save millions of dollars in crime prevention as well as health and other sectors. Next slide. And so just to give you a, a flavor of the work at the Louisiana Policy Institute, um, you can see our impact from 2020, where we helped, you know, make sure to protect uh, state dollars that were in the system already for early care and education. Uh, we helped support, you know, New Orleans put in $3 million uh, towards early care and education. Additionally, we've you know, done a lot of outreach. We're right now compiling our facts and figures for the 2021 app impact. But this impact wouldn't be possible without partners like the Chamber of Commerce and business. It's just, it's not feasible to think about. Next slide. And because of these partnerships that we've had, uh, if we think about our last legislative session, we had some really big wins for Louisiana for our little people. So much so that we have now 25% of 25% of sports betting revenue going towards the Louisiana Early Childhood Education Fund, up to $20 million. This investment is the largest revenue source for the Early Care and Education Fund to date, which is wildly exciting. And that 50% of the NBA Pelican specialty late played in our state, those revenues will also go towards this early childhood education fund. I would be remiss and not tell you that the early care and education, the early childhood education fund is a dollar for dollar match fund. So if I think about like Todd's from um, Jefferson Parish, their, their parish council has put up $225,000 of parish money. And so that within this fund with having revenue go to that fund, they can double the amount because they have parish money um, going towards early care and education. So it's really exciting to see the local state um, dialogue back and forth. The other thing that happened during the legislative session was that uh, stop taxing diapers. If we think about access to early care and education, we think about this. A lot of families have to have diapers to be able to go to childcare. And if you have a tax on top of that diaper, it adds to the expense and families Families can stretch diapers at home, but that's not the case at childcare. And so this is an access issue. So we're really, this was really exciting to see happen. And then additionally, a new post-secondary community college grant program for adults. Um, it's the Mike Foster program. We'll really explore childcare benefits uh, for recipients. So to make sure that people aren't dropping out of highly sought after certificate programs to get better jobs because they don't have access to childcare. And so we think about the wins for Louisiana. We had a really good year this past legislative season um, in the spring. Next slide. And again, how do we do this? We don't do this alone at the Policy Institute for Children. We do this in coalition. Um, and later, Candace will talk to you about our Ready Louisiana Coalition, as well as I'm sure Tim and Todd will probably mention it as well. But it's a coalition of over 100 organizations that squarely focus on how do we make sure our children are successful in school and in life by investing in early care and education. And so here's just some uh, contact, next slide, the next uh, contact information uh, for Candace and I, we'll make sure that you have this in the follow-up materials as well. But I'm really excited, next slide, uh, to really hear, hear about best practices from our industry champions. 
And so today um, you'll hear uh, first from Todd Murphy, who's the president of the Jefferson Chamber of Commerce. And you'll then hear from um, Dr. Timothy Magner, who is the president for the Greater Shreveport Chamber of Commerce. Next slide. So I'm gonna kick it over to Todd, who's just been an amazing advocate for young children in our state. And for him, he's gonna share with you today about why the Jefferson Chamber got involved and the story behind that. And I, let me be really honest, if you think about our Ready Louisiana Coalition and all the good work that we do at the Policy Institute, it's because of the gentlemen here that are gonna share with you. We couldn't do this work without their partnership and the partnership of their members as well. Todd? Well, very nice. Um, enjoyed your presentation and thanks for the nice introduction, Libby. So, you know, we're very fortunate uh, in our chamber um, to get involved. And, and I'm going to I'm going to start with the coalition since you kind of ended on that. Um, that coalition, you know, started, I, I believe, almost four years ago. And um, it was the Policy Institute for Children that came to us and a couple of other organizations, including the United Way of Southeast Louisiana, and said, hey, how do we get this going? How do we get the word out? Because um, we, like every issue that we tackle in the state legislature, which are, are numerous, we know that there's strength in numbers. And so um, this, this um, very loosely uh, fit, if you will, coalition was put together almost four years ago and today has, I think, over 70 organizations that are members of it. What I think is really interesting about it is that there are not many coalitions that you see that have chambers of commerce, economic development organizations, um, civic uh, organizations, uh, United Ways from across the state. And so really just everybody pulling in the, in the same direction that sees the need for this and the need to, to make this investment as Libby referred to it. Um, our board, I will tell you, um, I, I think, you know, every legislative session that rolls around, we're probably engaged in 12 to 15 different issues. And, you know, that might be 35 to 45 bills, knowing that some issues have multiple bills that are attached uh, or that originated out of either the House or the Senate. And, you know, I'm proud to say that when you look at those, you know, 40, 40 ish bills that come across every year, at least two of those uh, pertain to early childhood development. Our board has really put an emphasis on this uh, for the last four and a half years or so because of the fact that we understand. Um, the, the poverty that we have in Louisiana, um, the education rate that we have in Louisiana, that we're, we're you know, second to last in the United States in, in a country that's you know, probably eighth. Um, and, and so we, we struggle with those issues, but we also understand as our chamber engaged in some of the criminal justice reform just a few years back, uh, that we lead the country, if not the world, in the incarceration rate. And so how do, how do we as business leaders help solve the problem? How do we get engaged in this to help find solutions to funding to get, uh, to get kids uh, into learning earlier so that when, you're, when, when they hit kindergarten, you know, they know their alphabet, they know their, their colors. If, if, you know, in, in first grade and then third grade, we want them on, on a proficient uh, reading program. If not, it's very, very difficult to, to catch up. And think about this, if in the fourth grade, um, you're asked to solve a math equation. You can't do that if you can't read proficiently. And so these kids get demoralized. They never catch up. Um, they hit the sixth grade, the eighth grade, by the 10th grade. Um, a lot of them are out of school. If they're in school, they're in trouble. And so I think, um, I think that's really what kind of woke us up to the fact that this is somewhere where we need to invest. Because when you look at the, the statistics, and we leave all the statistics, by the way, to Libby and Candace and their organization. But when you, when you look at those real life numbers and which states are doing this, this properly, um, it's really a no brainer as to where the investment needs to go and, and, and why we need to invest in it. Um, I will say that, you know, this is a long-term investment. So when we're talking to our elected officials about getting engaged in funding for early childhood development, that's a little tough one. And I don't mean any disrespect to, to any of the elected officials, but let's face it, constituents want to see um, uh, measures that are being done in the community that are real life, if you will. They want to see a park. They want to see better roads. They want to see, you know, some sort of better access to services. Um, they want to see their trash picked up twice a week, um, whatever it might be. And so sometimes when you start talking to elect elected officials about something that might take four or five or 10 years, well, that's a long-term investment. 
I might not even be here anymore uh, because I don't get reelected or I'm term limited or whatever the case might be. And so sometimes that's a little more difficult conversation. So on our part, from the chamber standpoint, that takes a lot more education, right? I mean, we always say we have to educate before we can advocate. And so it takes more time to sit down with the state representatives, the state senators. And, and look, we see it every year in our, in our legislature, the representatives, the senators, and even the governor, uh, we're all behind it. We wanna fund it, we wanna fund it. And when, when it gets right down to it, they start shifting money to other areas um, so that they can get votes to pass a budget or so then they get votes for their own election or whatever it might be. So it really becomes a difficult situation, um, but one that I think that that our, um, our elected officials are starting to really grasp the importance of it, uh, especially on a state level. On a local level, <clears throat> Libby mentioned that, you know, Jefferson Parish had a recent commitment from our parish council, uh, I believe it was $225,000. And, you know, a lot of that, quite frankly, was due to grassroots efforts. Um, it, was, it was people uh, like the, the Policy Institute for Children. It was people like Paula Polito who, have, who has a local uh, daycare. Uh, and, and understands the issues and understands the expense and sitting across the table with our local council and saying, hey, you know, how do we how do we fix this problem that we know that we have? So our contribution from our council is pennies. Um, other, other cities such as even New Orleans are doing a much better job at this. And you won't hear me utter those words on, on any other topic other than early childhood. But they've got this one right. And they're putting their money uh, into investing into children. And so I think we've got to do a better job. We've got to do a better job in educating our local governments, uh, in some cases, maybe even our local school boards, um, certainly our local businesses. We need, we need contributions from the private sector. Um, and then a bigger lift from our state legislature and, and certainly from the governor. Um, this is a long-term play. It's, it's certainly not something that, you know, we think, oh, well, we can turn this around uh, in, in two years or three years, and all of a sudden you're going to see you know, better graduation rates, less dropout rates, uh, uh, you know, better informed and improved workforce. We really see this as a long-term play. And, and that's the, I think if there's, a, if there's a message that I try to relate over and over and over again, is that this is one of those things that an elected official can look back, uh, a CEO of a company can look back 10 and 15 years from now when people are saying, what really turned things around in South Louisiana or North Louisiana or Central Louisiana, what, what was it that really turned things around? People are going to look to this and say, well, it's when the council, you know, back in 2021 had the vision, the foresight to say, let's, in, let's take some of that money that we have coming down from the rescue funds, for example, let's take some of that money and put it into a trust just for this, just for this, just, just for early childhood funding. I think that's the difference. And I think that's something that it takes all of us working together. It takes every member of that coalition and others really just sitting across the table with our elected officials, with our CEOs, with, with people that have, quite frankly, charitable trust um, and, and explaining what this issue is. It, you know, look, I, I say it all the time. You know, people always say, oh, yeah, if it's for, for children, we want to help. Uh, but getting them to understand the issue and actually write the check sometimes is a different story. And so, um, I just applaud all of you for your interest in this. I think, I think this is a very worthy um, cause. Uh, our board certainly thinks so. We actually added this four years ago to our program of work. I mean, we used one of the, one of the bullets that we had that you know, we would stay engaged in is reform efforts for K through 12 education. We changed that to early childhood through, through 12. And I think you know, just some little things like that start to build this perception and start that people start asking questions. What does that mean early childhood? Um, does that mean kindergarten? No, not exactly. Let me explain. And so I think it's something that all of us need to put on our radar in a bigger, better way. And I think, um, you know, when we look back, it may take a few years, but I think when we look back, we're going to see that that long-term investment got kids into pre-K, got kids into kindergarten much more prepared than, than what we're seeing today. And, and look, I, I think, I think it was Libby that mentioned in her presentation, the cost of childcare and what it's costing our businesses and what it's costing to go. I mean, I think, I think the number you threw out was $8,700 a year. Think about that. That's a lot of money and that's after tax money. So um, it's a big investment. It's something that not everybody can afford. It's something that leaders that uh, like the people on this call certainly need to consider bringing back to your organizations and, and stepping up and helping us with. So 
thanks for the time. I'm, I'm honored and flattered uh, to be part of this. I know it was a long time in the making and we've had a lot going on here in Southeast, Southeast Louisiana with, with hurricanes and, and uh, just, just thrilled to, to be able to put this together. And uh, hopefully it's very informative today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Todd. Um, and I'd be remiss to say if people like Todd, uh, Todd and Tim weren't the champions that they were, we wouldn't have, you know, Lobby pick up the mantle of our state chamber to say early childhood is so important that just like Jefferson did and other chambers have done and say it's not just K-12 um, education and policy, it's early childhood through 12th grade so that we have a continuous system. I'd next like to introduce you to uh, Dr. Tim Magner, who I will also say is um, a wonderful board member at the Louisiana Policy Institute for Children, um, to share with you today what they're doing in the greater Shreveport area and why this investment in early care and education is so important from his perspective at his chamber at the greater Shreveport Chamber of Commerce. Tim, it's up to you now. Great. Thanks, Libby. I appreciate it. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Again, I, I think this is a critical issue and one that I think is going to, going to be, um, you know, we're laying the groundwork now for what, as Todd just said, is, is going to be a really, a hopefully, a generational change in, in how we address um, not just um, early childhood, but really look at it as, as workforce development sort of writ large. So I think one of the, the key things and kind of the, the way I like to frame my remarks today is really look at the different levels, because I think that when we look at, at early childhood, we tend to need to talk about everything from the state level all the way down to the, the mom and the dad who need to figure out what to do with their child in order to be able to give them a good, a good start, but also what, what to do when they go to work. So in Louisiana, we're um, uh, blessed, I think, to have a, a um, one of the best sort of policy frameworks um, that uh, is routinely um, uh, lauded around the country, which is our Act 3, which was really a set of um, legislation that was uh, designed a number of years ago to really establish a definition of kindergarten readiness and to put, to put some performance targets and academic standards in place and to then to have a uniform accountability system for early childhood education. So this has really set the framework for how when, when Libby talks about, when we all talk about high quality, we actually have a way to measure that in uh, in Louisiana. And there's a way for us to be able to not only measure it, but hold people accountable and then reward them for that for that accountability. So our ability to be able to not only identify quality, but to be able to recognize and reward that I think goes a long way in terms of building the, the type of system that we ultimately want to see. What was a, a huge learning for me, though, is that there's a real distinct difference between when we talk about early uh, early childhood education writ large and kindergarten readiness. And I think a lot of people, have their sort of default position when they start having those conversations is really to look at, well, okay, well, we'll have the school system open up and do all four-year-olds and, and that'll solve the problem. And there are two sort of challenges with that. One is that, for example, in Louisiana, I think we, um, have slots for about 96% of four-year-olds. So 96% of four-year-olds have somewhere to go. The challenge is when you look at that from an early childhood perspective, from a business perspective, is that pulling out the four-year-olds really sort of upends the economies of scale that make it possible to be able to offer infant and toddler care. And that's something that, again, I don't think many people fully recognize is that the because of the enhanced needs of, of infants and toddlers in particular, you need to have more caregivers per child. It kind of makes sense when you think about it, but as a consequence, it's more expensive. And so part of the way that you smooth that out in similar ways that we do with um, special education in K-12 is that you essentially have enough people paying into it that you're able to differentiate at the, at the staff level and still provide a, essentially a, a cost model that, that addresses everyone's needs. When you pull those four-year-olds out, then it becomes very difficult for those for the um, early childhood centers to be able to sustain and to be able to, um, to be able to survive. So, so as a consequence, it's a little more complicated calculation. We clearly want, um, want um, kindergarten readiness to be a focus, and ultimately that starts at infant and toddler care, but um, making sure that we understand the, the sort of economic implications of those policy choices, I think has a, has a really important um, dynamic at play as well. In addition, I think COVID has really demonstrated for us 
that this is not just an individual issue, it's really a systemic issue. And it's a systemic issue at a point where so many of the people who need it most are least able to be able to either afford it or to be able to, to organize it. And so when you have both supply constraints because you're tinkering with the four-year-olds and you have demand constraints because you've got demand far out um, stripping supply, you create this, this friction in the system that makes it very, very difficult for us to operate. And I think that's where, as we look at, from my perspective, the question of scale, it becomes really critical for us to think about what, what we're talking about in terms of the volume. So for example, in, in Louisiana, we spend about $3.9 billion uh, in, in education. That's sort of the budget number that they're throwing around and about 1.7 billion in, um, in, early, in, in higher education. We're spending in the millions in, in early childhood. And when Libby talks about $20 million, you know, a, a cap of $20 million as, as in um, with sports betting as sort of the, the best, the, the next best hope for early childhood education. In a lot of ways, unfortunately, that, that's a drop in the bucket. So when you, so for example, in, in our uh, parish, which is like a county, up here, we have about 17,500 kids, roughly zero to five. About 8,500 of those have some place to go. And so using Libby's earlier number, if you're looking at about $6,000 per kid, so 8,500 times 6,000 is about $50 million a year. So in order to provide truly universal care, it would cost over and above about $50 million more than we're expending right now on an annual basis. Um, similarly, at a state level, you're looking at somewhere between 800 and a billion dollars a year. Again, if you were, this is just if the state's going to write the check. And so when you start to think about numbers at that level, this idea of policy realignment has to take a systemic approach, right? The idea of sort of, you know, there's that old bumper sticker, you know, which the, you know, the Air Force had to hold a bake sale to buy a bomber kind of thing, right? We're, we're suddenly at a point where if we're starting to think about how do we generate the level of funding that makes this possible, you have to begin to look at both systemic and, and the kinds of things that Todd was talking about at the state level, but you also have to look about look at how you create incentives to build on the supply side as well. And so I think at, as we look at the challenges here in, in, in Kettle Parish, it's, it's how do we, first of all, measure that demand? Obviously not every child or every family needs or wants to send their children uh, to, uh, to an early childhood education center, but we, we still don't have enough seats for all those that do. And so what are the, the, the delivery vectors, if you will, that we can put together to be able to provide that? Clearly there's the public system um, with expanding access through um, uh, the school system, but we also have faith-based, we also have home-based, we also have private centers. And I think that from a policy perspective, both at the local state and the, even the federal level, recognizing that that hybrid system is probably one of the mo more efficient delivery models so that we're not talking about necessarily creating a new public infrastructure to deliver these, these services. But we have to look at how we provide a braided funding stream that makes that possible. And so it, it is going to be a combination of, um, of educators, of providers, of businesses, and of municipalities coming together to figure out what that model is. Um, there are federal dollars that are available. Um, some of those are state dollars, but families also have a role to play and business does as well. And I think that's where the conversation that we've been having internally is really about how do we, how do we create a an, an, an dialogue in our community about what, what works for us and what are the mechanisms that are possible for us to be able to provide some of those um, funding models or some of those incentive structures to encourage businesses to to create child care centers because at the end of the day one of the flip side of this is that all or many child care centers are businesses and so that has an opportunity if we can create the right incentive structure to not only provide for lo localities and whether that's again um, home-based care or whether that is um, um, religious institutions or, or faith-based organizations or whatever, but if we can create incentives that make those types of, of centers possible, we now have an ability to be able to sh um, shuttle families 
out to those. So for example, here, um, similar in, in, in some ways to what uh, happened in Jefferson Parish, our Caddo Parish Commission put up a couple hundred thousand dollars to help support early childhood education. Our community foundation has raised a million dollars to go with that state match. So we now have somewhere around two two million dollars if the state matches it, um, or at least a million dollars if they don't, to put into early childhood education. The challenge for us is that at two million dollars, you're looking at about 300 kids. And so that's, you know, so again, if you get to 8,500, great, that's 300 families that, that now have new opportunities. But again, the level, the scale of what's, of what's necessary versus what's possible or really becomes critical. So for us, uh, I'm, I'm working with the U.S. Chamber um, and, and their efforts, um, groups like Ready Louisiana, it is going to be a dialogue that we have to have about and the new reality of how we deliver high quality services to all families or all families who want it. And then what does that look like and how do we fund it? Because I think if we continue to go at this sort of band-aided solution or tin cup kind of model and looking at it a million dollars at a time, I don't think we're gonna get there at scale that allows us to see, to reap the benefits that we all know um, the research suggests um, will come to us down, this, down, down the line. We don't want to bifurcate, further bifurcate the system so you now have more kids who are prepared than unprepared and that that, that gap continues to widen either because either on racial lines or economic lines or just geography. And so I, I do think that there's a there's a, a systemic question that we have to um, begin to address as a, as a group about what's the what's the appropriate local response an effort, where does the business community play a role? What are the state policy frameworks that need to be in place? And then what's available at the federal level to begin to provide that umbrella, either of accountability or services or funding that enables us to have those, uh, those systems level conversations. Thanks so much, Tim. Uh, it, it's always good to hear it from people from the business side of why this is so impactful. And so we appreciate both you and Todd. I'm gonna kick it over to Kat now for a Q&A period um, before we get to our call to action for everybody. Hi everyone. So now is the opportunity to, uh, if it's appropriate, uh, take yourself off the um, hiding your screen and ask those questions and unmute yourself. Um, if other people are speaking, you can feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, but uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and start asking some of those questions. And the questions can be for either Timothy or Todd. And if there's some questions that didn't get addressed um, in Libby's presentation, you can bring those up as well. Um, but now is the time to ask some questions with some of your chamber peers. And uh, they can be anything from, you know, how to implement in your own chamber, how you got started. It can be specific questions about um, some of the tactics that they're using. We're open to them all. So I just I, I just put the link to Act Three in the um, in the chat for folks who are interested in in seeing that. And, and I will say that I think to Libby's point and, and what Todd was saying earlier, the idea of a coalition is really critical. This is not something that any one sector, whether it's the early childhood sector, or the business community, or even policy wonks, are going to be able to solve. This is going to have to be a, a you know a broad based dialogue. And so our ability to participate and to have coalitions like. Um, Ready Louisiana and have groups like like Libby's um, out there sort of leading those and, and building, stitching together those, those constituencies is really important. And I want to um, follow up to something that uh, Tim and Todd alluded to earlier about, you know, the amount of resources that we allocate from the state to early care and education. If you look at our state's budget, we spend half of 1% on early care and education in the state. Uh, and so when we say that we're four children, what we know is that the budget is, is a proposition of what we think is important. Uh, and so that's why, you know, people like Tim and Todd raising, elevating their voices when Lobby comes out and elevates their voices and we elevate our voices through strong coalition, um, people tend to listen. And yes, $20 million is a kick in the bud, you know, kick in the bucket related to what we really need for early care and education, but at least it was like a ding in the bucket uh, for the first time. But I, I think I, I can speak, 
I'll speak for Tim and Todd too here and say like, we're just tired of people using the words. We need people to use the actions of how do we fund a system? Um, and that's where your voices become so critically important. Kat, I think you had a couple of questions um, if I remember correctly. So, the, so Rumship just put a question oh, in here. Great. The US Chamber is a partner. Um, so local associations, um, Again, we've worked um, closely with our community foundation. We've worked closely with folks like United Way, with our school system, um, Junior Achievement. I mean, there are lots of groups that sort of what I would call the usual suspects, people who are, are focused on, on either education writ large or on workforce, um, as well as um, you know, faith-based organizations. Again, I think you see, especially in the South, especially in this area, um, faith-based organizations have, a, have an outsized role often in what I would call sort of extra curricular or extra educational um, outreach and support. And um, so many of those, I think, can be can be uh, important partners in those in those dialogues. And, and I think to, to that degree, the broader the coalition that you can pull together, um, the, the more voices you can hear from and the better systems or the better alignments you can develop. No, I'm actually going to stop. Oh, go ahead. If you have a question, go ahead. Sorry. So, uh, Tim or Todd, either one of you, anything outside of full funding that anyone is working on, you know, possible just a 50% scholarship things or vouchers, anything outside the box that we could tackle it from a different angle to get some momentum on things? Anybody come up with any initiatives that where the parents have a little skin in the game and they are still part of? Well, I'll say this, there's always skin in the game for parents, even if they receive child care assistance. So it's child care assistance program, which mm -hmm. is basically a voucher program that that CCAP funding only covers part of the tuition. So if there's a gap between between what they receive from as support from um, the state and what the tuition is, the family has to come up with that, that dollar Those amount fees. gap. What's scary about that is the very children that need access to quality early care and education, their families many times don't have that, that gap between childcare assistance and the tuition because it could be up to two or $3,000. And so it's, you know, one of the things that we've worked really hard with the state is to cover more with child care assistance so that it's not creating an access issue for families to even be able to take take part in that program. One of the other things that we've done or that's, that's available in the state is something called the school readiness tax credit. And that's kind of an interesting model. And what that does is it allows businesses to donate up to $5,000 to one of the regional um, service um, areas um, that provides early childhood uh, education support, and then in return they get a they get a tax credit for that amount from the state. And so what that does, first of all, it puts some some um, action, if you will, um, in of the businesses into that process, and it allows you to target those dollars locally. So we're able to work with the the group um, that that, that um, manages things up here, and put those dollars into. Um, manipulatives or into um, support for scholarships or things like that. And so it's a way of helping to, to structure the and allocate resources um, at a local level, but it's done through that state model. So that's kind of an interesting, I guess, to me, a little out of the box uh, in that it, it uh, it's, it's basically leveraging local businesses to target state dollars to local needs. A really great example. Are there other examples of ways local businesses are attracting high quality child care providers and attracting recruiters or employers? It's I mean, we've got a we've got a couple of uh, one of our larger employers is a is a hospital system and and particularly for nurses because this became a, a significant issue during COVID. Um, you know, they're looking at providing um, child care you know on site you know, at the hospital, uh, particularly for their nursing staff, again, as a way of not only, you know, addressing the, the need that, that um, they need have, have as parents, but it helps, 
um, focus, you know, helps allow the, the uh, nurses to focus on their patients because they're not worried about their kids or where they're going to pick them up or where they're going to be. And if, if there's some, you know, overlap or slack time or whatever at the end of a shift, um, you know, the children are on site, so they're not having to worry about how they're going to get picked up and things like that. So there aren't a lot of employers in our area that have the, the footprint to be able to do that because I know a lot of large employers around the country are already engaged in those conversations about on-site child care. But it was one of those things that, although it had been part of the dialogue for a while, COVID and, and in particular, the, the nursing shortage really created a dynamic that encouraged them uh, as employers to see that as a need, um, as a perk, but also as a need that, uh, that helped them uh, deliver better services um, to the patients who needed it. And of course, the challenge there is, Tim, is to make sure that learning is happening. You know, yeah. it's... Uh, goal, goal one is to make sure they're cared for and, and loved, but, and two is the learning piece. And that's, that's the difficult piece when you try to, when you try to take this to scale uh, within corporations. Yeah. Todd, this is Ron Erickson with the Central Chamber. You'd mentioned about getting local governments to help fund this project. How did you go about getting them convinced to do that? Where do those funds go to? And who monitors the distribution of those? Okay, so I'll take a shot at that and I see that uh, Paula I'll add is- in, yeah. And so, I can add in from the Orleans perspective as well. Yeah, so yeah, so y'all y'all take it and run with it. I'll tell you, Ron, it's, um, it starts with uh, relationships which are built on trust. And so when we've got, you know, our board members that are sitting down with councilmen explaining what, why this is important, what it, a lot of them said, what is it? Um, some of them don't say that. Some of them say, no, I know we have a problem and I need help. Um, but when our board members go face to face, um, as we saw recently, you know, I think, I think the money follows. So uh, Libby, Paul, I'll, I'll let you guys chime in if you if you so inclined. Sure, I'll kick in and then I'll kick it over to Paula, who's work, we both work intimately with Jefferson. But what happened in Orleans is that the city council decided to do an initial investment investment for the 2018 fiscal year of $750,000 uh, because they under, the city council understood the need for high quality early care and education. Over the years, it's now a $3 million investment of city money. Um, and how it is allocated is it goes through the, to the lead agency. So the lead agency for early care and education in Orleans Parish is Agenda for Children. Um, so, and then the lead agency in Jefferson Parish is the Jefferson Parish School Board and as well as the, their Ready Start Network, which is again, a, a network for early care and education, um, the system. And so in Orleans, what happens is the money um, goes to the network and then they allocate the seats and all the seats that are allocated to childcare providers are allocated to childcare providers that are a part of the accountability system. And they, they are either proficient or high proficient, proficiently rated. So these are centers that we know have quality as measured by our system. Uh, and so it's also the, the dollars are allocated per, per child in the sense of we know that actual cost of care to provide high quality care of it in education, it really costs about $16,000 per child per year. And so in Orleans, they've allocated that that amount of money per child. And that also includes administrative costs as well. And I'll kick it over to Paula to talk about what's happening in Jefferson Parish, which is really exciting as well. Thank you, Libby. And yes, I'd echo everything Libby said. And, and even to Todd's point about the relationships, I think it's sometimes difficult to understand what it looks like on the ground. And the Policy Institute for many years has offered what we call early ed day, an opportunity to get businesses into the child care centers to see what this quality, we, we often talk quality, what it looks like, how do we prepare these children for kindergarten? So I think that's helpful as well. But um, specifically in Jefferson Parish, what we were able to do is, again, based on that relationship with some of the council members, is to say, hey, look, we know the investment um, needs to happen. Can you sort of kick that off? And so the Jefferson Parish Council had donated $250,000 to that early ed fund, which Libby said will get that dollar for dollar match and then flow through the lead agency Jefferson Parish school system and fund X amount of seats in high quality 
early care and education sites. So those are type three sites in Jefferson Parish, but that was initially done. So our initial investment was through the Jefferson Parish Council. We've got some great um, video on our login, uh, LinkedIn site, as well as our Facebook page. Scott Walker um, really spearheaded those efforts and um, he, he talks about how important that investment is. Thanks so much, Paula. And if I could just clarify, um, Paula is a board member of the Jefferson Chamber. She's also an, the owner of a local, uh, one of the premier child care centers in Jefferson Parish with over 200 kids that attend there. And so having somebody with that knowledge uh, and with that passion that will, will go to the parish council, will go to the state legislat legislature and, and testify is huge. And it's a big lift. And uh, I know that you guys have those sort of people in your community. So um, just wanted to clarify uh, Paula's role. Thank you. That's a good point. I also say that Paula is a tireless advocate and none of us tell her no. So <laughs> she goes and says, ask for something. I don't tell her no either. You know, like she's like, Libby, I need data. I need to understand this. I'm like, Whatever you need, Paula. Cause like when you have that kind of advocacy and, and her being involved in the chamber and recommend, you know, recognized as a small business owner that has, you know, really promotes quality and what's meaningful to young children and their families. It's just, it's beyond meaningful and it's purposeful and it's always helpful. I'm gonna turn it to Kat now to be mindful yep. people's time. Yes, we're a couple of minutes left. If there are questions that you still have, you can still drop them into the chat or you can email us or some contact slides at the end. Um, we do wanna keep these relationships going and have these conversations and dialogue. So um, don't feel like uh, just because we're running out of time that we can't keep these conversations going offline. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Candice and I'm gonna turn these slides back on. All right. All right. And I know we only have a few minutes left. So um, good afternoon. Uh, again, I'm Candace Weber, Partnerships Director at the Policy Institute. First, I just have to say great discussion uh, from everyone. And Todd and Tim, thank you both for your unwavering support and commitment to solving early care and education in our state. Um, your efforts are certainly making an impact in your respective areas and communities. So thank you. Um, to the Louisiana ACCE members with us today, as you've already heard, uh, the data clearly shows that early care and education is an economic issue that's impacting our state. Uh, we know it's a workforce productivity issue and a participation issue that's impacting our workforce of today and our workforce of tom tomorrow. We also know that business leaders like you uh, have the power to champion high quality child care and can make it top of mind for our elected officials and policymakers who can really change the trajectory of our workforce. Um, we know that without comprehensive policies, there are no long-term strategic solutions to the workforce challenge our economy is facing, but we can solve this with your help. Uh, next slide. Next slide. So here at the Policy Institute, we are an active member of the Ready Louisiana Coalition, which you've already heard a lot about on this call. So if you're not already a member, we encourage you to join us as a member. Um, again, Ready Louisiana is a bipartisan statewide coalition that was formed just a few years ago, but as Libby mentioned, it already has over 100 businesses, chambers, uh, advocacy organizations, and early care and education professionals, all who are seeking sufficient investment in quality, affordable early care and education in our state because strong economies start with strong early care and education systems. You can visit the website for more information. So on your screen, it's the www.readylouisiana.org. It's very easy to join. Um, upon going to the website, just look for the words, join us on the top far right of your screen. It only requires you to um, enter your name, the name of your organization or business and the best email address where you can be contacted. I'm also offering my contact information. You can contact me directly if you have any questions or if you need more information. Uh, but I can assure you that we are ready for you to join the Ready Louisiana Coalition. Um, in the next few days, you will receive a recording of this webinar, uh, along with the presentation, a full report of the research that Libby presented today, an executive summary and contact information. Uh, next slide. Uh, thank you for making the time to join this webinar on this very important topic. Um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon and we look forward to connecting with you soon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.
Thanks. Thank you, Tim and Todd. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.